Tana, uh, for the very kind introduction. Uh, can you see my slides? Just want to confirm it. Yes, I can see. Okay, great. I can hear you, great. I can see your slides. <laughs> Hey, uh, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Stephen Kaskell for inviting me to deliver uh, this lecture today uh, to the MOF community. And my talk today is about using high resolution electron microscopy to study the local structures in MOFs. Uh, MOFs are crystalline materials. So uh, yeah, as we know, uh, to study a crystalline structure, uh, diffraction is always the first choice, right? Uh, from yesterday's presentation, Xiaodong's uh, talk, I think we already see how powerful diffraction is. Well, the outcome of diffraction is an union cell. Well, uh, the union cell represents the average bulk periodic structure of the crystal. Right? Actually, uh, we can also study the crystal structure in, in the real space by using high resolution imaging technique. For example, uh, using high, uh, HRTM. Okay. So the advantage of uh, imaging is that it can be used to study the bulk periodic structure. Well, at the same time, it can be used to study the local non-periodic structures. For example, the surface of the crystals, uh, the boundary between crystals, defects, gas molecules, and this kind of local uh, structure features because they are non-periodic. So usually they are not visible uh, in diffraction. Well, as you may know, a, a modern TM microscope now can provide a sub astrom resolution that is high enough to uh, resolve individual atoms. However, uh, HRTM of MOFs is very challenging. This is because MOFs are extremely sensitive to the electron beam irradiation. So once exposed to the electron beam, the MOF structure will be immediately damaged. And so, you know, for this kind of beam sensitive material, for example, for a MOF, actually the structure information contained in the HRTM image is not really determined by how uh, good the microscope is. It's not determined by the resolving power of the microscope, but instead it's de determined by the stability of the materials. I mean, the beam stability. In other words, uh, how much structure integrity can be preserved uh, under the electron beam, I mean, under the imaging conditions. Okay, so uh, actually the uh, high resolution imaging of uh, electron beam sensitive material is one of the most ap difficult applications of TEM. So here uh, I give you one example to explain this uh, beam sensitivity problem. So this is a TEM image of CIF8 and this image was acquired with an electron dose of about 1000 electrons per square astron, which is a very typical electron dose used uh, for conventional HRTM. However, as you can see here, under these very typical conditions, the ZF8 crystalline structure has been completely destroyed by the electron beam. So what we can see from the image are just amorphous particles without any useful information. Okay? So this result explains why conventional HRTM is not suitable uh, for imaging sensitive materials like MOFs. So to uh, quantitatively understand um, the beam sensitivity of ZF8, so we conducted electron diffraction experiments uh, and then we monitor the structure evolution of ZIF8 under the electron beam irradiation. Well, it turned out that when the cumulative electron dose reached as low as 15 electrons per square astron, the structure damage occurs. Right? So this value is very low, right? It, it compared to the conventional uh, electron dose we used, it's, it's about two orders of magnitude lower, okay? Yeah. Well, we have also uh, evaluated the stability, the beam stability of some other MOFs using the same methods. Well, although the exact beam tolerance uh, depends on many factors, for example, it depends on the MOF structure, it depends on the energy of the electron beam, it depends on uh, the size and the orientation of the crystals. Well, in general, all the studied MOFs are very, very sensitive to the beam and their beam tolerance is in the range of five to 30 electrons per square astron. This is a very low. So conventional HRTM cannot be conducted at such a low dose condition because you know, with such a low dose, uh, the signal to noise ratio of the image will be too poor to show uh, information. All right, so this situation is just like, you know, uh, taking a photo picture uh, in a dark room where because the, the light illumination is limited, 
so we cannot see much in the picture, right? So to solve this problem, uh, we have to develop new uh, imaging methods. So which we call here, we call uh, ultra low dose HRTM, okay? ultra low dose HRTM. So to make a long story short, we uh, basically we solve this problem in two steps. Uh, in the first step, uh, we collaborated with uh, Dr. Ming Pan uh, from Gatan company. And we, dem we together uh, demonstrated that a new type of camera that is called direct detection electron counting camera. Uh, this new type of camera is sensitive enough to show uh, image at the ultra low dose conditions required by the MOFs. Okay? And in the second step, we develop some uh, methods to further improve uh, the efficiency and also the quality of the HRTM enabled by this new camera. Okay, so, so simply speaking, the first step is about the application of a new hardware, a new camera, very sensitive camera. And the second step is about development of some softwares to solve some uh, practical problem related to the low dose imaging. Okay, so taken together, we are now able to uh, use HRTM to study MOFs at atomic resolution. I will show you some examples. So yeah, using this developed method, we have already imaged uh, different morph materials and our focus uh, is on their local structures, including their, the crystal surface and uh, the crystal interface, gas molecules, missing linker, missing cluster defects, and so on. Right? So next, I will quickly go through some examples. So before we started the local structures, uh, we started with the bulk structures. Uh, most MOFs uh, have known crystal structures that are solved by uh, X-ray diffraction. Right? So in this sense, uh, imaging the bulk structure doesn't provide uh, additional structure information. However, I would say imaging the known bulk structure is necessary and actually very important. This is because the known bulk structure can be used as a reference, which allows us to confirm that the, the imaging condition we use is safe enough to preserve the structure from damage. And then uh, this will ensure that, you know, the observed local structures are inherent, not induced by the beam damage effects. I'm sure you agree with me. Uh, it doesn't make sense to, uh, image local structures under conditions that can damage the bulk structure, right? So we, ha we have to start with the bulk to make sure the imaging condition is safe, okay? So this is a HRTM image uh, of UIO66, and this particular image was acquired with total electron dose uh, of about 10 electrons per square astron, okay? And the image re resolution is about 1.5 astron. This means the structure is very well preserved. Well, we process the image and then the processed image shows a perfect match with the uh, 110 projected structure model of UIO66. As you can see here, all the I mean, important structure features in this projection, including these uh, triangular channels, these uh, inverted triangular channels, these uh, zirconium zirconium clusters, the organic uh, BDC linkers, all these structure features can be clearly identified uh, in the image. So this result confirms that the crystal structure of UIO66 is very well preserved under the ultra low dose condition we used. Well, after we confirm that the imaging conditions is safe from the bulk structure, then we can move on to uh, study the local structures. In this particular case, we observe the crystal surface, the crystal surface structure. And it's very interesting to see the surface termination uh, of UIO66 is actually facies dependent. Okay, so on this uh, major 111 surface, actually we found that the surface is terminated by organic linkers. Well, at, at, over here we have this uh, truncated surface which consists of the 100111 uh, kink positions. And at this kink positions, we can see uh, it's terminated by metal cluster. So two different surface termination modes coexist in this single crystal. Well, we also study the uh, crystal surface of mu 101 
and we follow the same uh, logic. So we started with imaging the bulk structure to confirm that the imaging, condi uh, the imaging conditions are safe. Okay? So mu 101 has a very large unit cell and very complicated structure. Okay? Well, even so, our image shows a perfect matching with the projected structure model. So again, uh, the major structure features, including these uh, mesoporous cages and the surrounding much smaller uh, channels and the uh, chromium uh, clusters can all be identified in the image. So again, this confirm the imaging conditions are safe. And then uh, we studied three mu 101 samples synthesized with different additives as modulators, uh, HF, acetic acid, and the no additive. Uh, I think in the community is very well known that the modulator can influence the the crystal uh, the crystallization process of the morph, right? So it can change, it can tune the crystallinity and the crystal size of the morph. Well, in our study, we found that the modulator can actually also influence or the surface structure of mu 101. So we use the uh, completeness of the mesoporous cage to describe the state of the surface. So as you can see from the image shown here in uh, figure D, E, and F, in the three samples, we identified three different types of surface. Okay? So in, in, in uh, the sample synthesized with HF, we can see the surface is composed of very open cages, right? very open cages. Well, the sample synthesized with acetic acid, the surface mesoporous cages are closed. Well, the sample synthesized without additive has a surface state in between, in between. Okay. And uh, another very interesting phenomenon we found is that after uh, vacuum drying at 150 degree, the surface structure of the sample synthesized with HF changed from closed to open. Well, the other two samples uh, remain the original surface structure. So this observation just suggests that maybe the sample with HF has a lower thermal stability or is more sensitive to thermal treatment than the other two samples. Also to confirm this uh, uh, speculation, we conducted in situ heating XRD experiment. And the result confirmed that the sample synthesized with HF uh, is more sensitive to thermal treatment and is prone to structure change as compared to the other two samples. When, and we observed a phase uh, transformation from mu 101 to mu 53, uh, starting at about 120 degree. Well, this phase transformation phenomenon, uh, we don't see it in the other samples, in the cases of the other two samples. And uh, besides the surface structure, we have also used a HRTM to study uh, interfacial structure formed by, you know, assembled morph crystals. So Z8 nanocrystals tend to assemble through uh, the uh, integrals of the 110 surfaces, when forming a, a coherent interface between crystals. Okay. So here is an TM image showing such an interface over here. This image was actually the first ever atomic resolution image of a morph, and it was acquired by a Dr. Mingpan. So based on the HRTM image, we could analyze the interfacial structure and the result uh, shows that actually at the crystal interface, there is an additional layer of the uh, imidazole uh, linker. So because of this uh, additional layer of the organic linker over there, uh, there are larger cavities formed at the crystal interface. And with this, we can uh, better understand how the assembly of these nanocrystals will influence the gas transport property. And uh, yeah, MOVs are very often used as a host materials to encapsulate gas molecules, right? Uh, however, it's very difficult to determine the exact location of the gas molecules in the MOV matrix. So with HRTM, we are now able to directly see where the gas molecules are. So in this case, we collaborated with uh, Mario's group at Clarkson University and uh, they uh, immobilize single molecule magnets in NU1000. 
And um, based on the dimension of the gas molecules, they predicted that this uh, magnesis cluster should be located in the primary hexagonal channels of N, uh, NU1000. Well, our HRTM uh, observations confirm that this is indeed the case. So as you can see from this low magnification image, there are many uh, black dots uh, widely distributed uh, within the morph matrix. Well, if you zoom in, uh, you will see actually each black dot very precisely reside in the hexagonal channels, in the hexagonal channels. So yeah, HRTM make it possible to directly uh, locate the gas molecules in the morph matrix. And we also studied structural defects in morphs. Uh, the existence of a missing linker and missing cluster defects in morphs has been speculated from some indirect uh, experimental phenomenon, such as a non stoichiometric uh, composition or uh, abnormal uh, gas adsorption behaviors. And uh, the presence of these uh, defects has also been confirmed by uh, diffraction-based uh, technique because some, for example, with missing cluster defects, the symmetry forbidden uh, reflection can be observed in diffraction. Right. However, it's very difficult to determine the precise structure of such defects. And also it's difficult to know uh, whether the defects are random or are ordered. Okay, and if they form ordered the domain, uh, what's the domain size and how the domains are distributed within the crystals, within the morph crystals. So this kind of information can be, uh, I mean, obtained by imaging, by imaging. So using HRTM, we observed, uh, we observed uh, ordered missing linker defects in UIO 66. And this ordered missing linker defects actually their presence can be easily identified directly from the image contrast by comparing the image with the image of the perfect UIO66 uh, UIO structure. And so we can uh, acquire the image from different zoom axes. So we have multiple image from different directions, which allow us to even re three dimensionally reconstruct it, the uh, missing linker defect structure. Okay, so this is the three dimensional reconstruction results, which shows a uh, eight connected uh, framework. Well, the the four uh, linkers in these horizontal planes are missing, and at the same time, the reconstruction data show this uh, defects capping group are forming. Are forming. I think this result makes sense because this particular sample was synthesized with a large amount of uh, formic acid in the system, in the synthetic system. Well, to confirm this result, we use a carbon-13 labeled formic acid for the synthesis. And then we characterize the sample using HPLC, uh, TG mass, and the uh, carbon AMR. Well, all these characterizations show that there are format group in the defective UIO 66. And this result is consistent with our HRTM uh, observations. And it's very interesting to note that we also observed ordered missing cluster defects in the same sample, in the same sample. So ordered missing cluster defects, uh, as I mentioned, will give uh, the symmetry forbidden reflections in diffraction. However, this is the first time to see them in the real space, in the real space. And we found, compared with the missing linker defects, the missing cluster defects are very small in, in dimension, uh, usually only, you know, across uh, a few unit cells. And uh, the missing cluster domain always uh, appear uh, along with the missing linker defects. Yeah, so they coexist and uh, the missing cluster defects uh, I mean, missing cluster domains always reside inside the area of the missing linker domains. So in this study, we totally identified three types of defects in uh, UIO 66, including one uh, missing linker defect and two types of missing cluster defects. And uh, we found they coexist in the same crystal, 
I mean, in the same sample. And uh, their framework openness uh, increase in this order from the left to the, to the right, uh, the, the, the framework become more open. Well, another interesting phenomenon we observed in this system is that the defects evolve uh, with crystallization. So the sample collected after one hour of crystallization consists of very small crystals. Well, it can, at this stage, the sample contain a large amount of missing cluster defects. Well, as the crystallization time is extended to one day and then to three days, we found the missing cluster defects become less and less, while the missing linker defects remain. Okay. So correspondingly, we can see from the uh, gas adsorption system, the total power volume is decreasing as the crystallization time increase. And the pore size distribution re related to the missing cluster defects disappear at three days, after three days. Okay. And more interestingly, the extension of the crystallization time with the, uh, will make the crystal uh, size continue to grow. Okay? As you can see from one hour to one day to three day, the, the crystal size continues to grow. And this indicates a the, the crystal ripening process. Right? So taken together, the structure defects evolves during the crystallization. Well, at the same time, the crystals undergo a ripening process. Well, knowing this uh, information, we can prepare a number of uh, UIO66 samples with different defects, taps, and different concentrations by tuning the crystallization time combined with the uh, defect healing method. And uh, then we use these samples as Lewis acid catalyst for uh, the isomerization of glucose to a fructose. And then we found a clear correlation between the catalytic activity with the degree of the structure defects. Well, uh, I have introduced uh, uh, some uh, examples about the MOP imaging. Actually, the developed uh, ultra low dose HRTM methods can also be applied to image other beam sensitive materials, including coughs, uh, super molecular crystals, and organic inorganic hybrid materials, for example, perovskite. And due to the time limitation, I just quickly show you two examples of MOFs, uh, sorry, of COFs. Yeah. Uh, in 2017, uh, we imaged a TPA-based cough that has a two-dimensional hexagonal structure. And we can, from the image, we can identify the one-dimensional channels. And we can also see the molecular building blocks uh, in the framework. And early this year, uh, we used this technique to distinguish uh, two different uh, topologies uh, from two uh, related cough materials. So due to the presence of ab uh, absence of the uh, intramolecular hydrogen bonding, uh, either a dual pore uh, Kagomi structure or a single pore rhombic structure can be synthesized from two uh, otherwise essentially the same synthetic systems. Right? So yeah, so the, the by using HRTM, we can easily distinguish these two structures. And I put the structure side by side here for easy comparison. And this work was mainly done by one of my former uh, group members, uh, Dr. Yi Han Zhu, and who is currently in Zhejiang University of Technology, and in collaboration with uh, Professor Hua Zhang in uh, Hong Kong City University. All right. Uh, uh, let me summarize what I have discussed so far. So briefly, uh, I introduced an ultra low dose HRTM technique that combines the use of a DDEC camera with some self-developed image acquisition and processing methods. And using this new technique, we have imaged a number of morphs and other beam sensitive materials, and we focus on their local structures. Right? So in the next 10 minutes or so, um, I will briefly introduce some more recent work. Uh, two topics. The first topic is about imaging MOFs uh, using scanning TM, STEM. And the second topic is about how to prepare uh, TM specimen uh, by using a new technique.
Corel focused iron beam, like Corel FIB technique. So scanning TM, or uh, usually we call it STEM, use the focused beam for imaging. So in comparison with normal TM, STEM uh, has some advantages. For example, STEM usually give more uh, interpretable uh, image and give better image contrast. And STEM also allow us to do you know, micro region analysis. Okay. However, because T, uh, STEM use a focused beam for imaging, so the instantaneous electron dose is much higher than normal TM. And so conventionally, people think STEM is not suitable uh, for sensitive materials because it will bring even more severe damage, structure damage than normal TM. Okay. Well, recently a new STEM uh, technique uh, is called IDPC STEM uh, emerged. And we found this IDPC STEM is very suitable for low dose imaging, for low dose imaging. And uh, it has some very unique property. For example, compared with standard STEM modes, IDPC STEM gave the best image contrast and signal to noise ratio under the exactly the same probe conditions. So that means IDPC STEM is very suitable for low dose imaging for uh, beam sensitive material. Okay. And uh, as compared to uh, normal HRTM, that requires very complicated image processing to make the image interpretable. Well, IDPC STEM image can be more easily interpreted. Okay, so basically it's directly interpreted. So yeah, this is a very, uh, very significant advantage. And another advantage associated with IDPC STEM is that it, it allows simultaneous imaging of heavy and light elements. Okay, so uh, these advantages are, I think, very well illustrated in this example. Here I show um, some image, uh, including, I mean, we use different imaging modes, including a normal HRTM and the standard uh, bright field or dark field stem and IDPC stem. And the specimen is a zeolite uh, with some organic compounds absorbed in the 10 membrane channels. Well, if you compare this image, you will see as compared with normal TEM or standard stem, the IDPC stem shows the best contrast for the framework of the zeolites. And well, more importantly, only in the IDPC stem, we can see the absorbed uh, hydrocarbon compounds in the channels very clearly. Right, very clearly. So this is because IDPC can simultaneously image heavy and light elements. And this is particularly useful for MOVs because MOV is composed of heavy metals with light organic linkers. Right? So we recently uh, used IDPC stem to uh, image uh, molybdenum atoms in uh, zeolite channels. And based on the positions of the molybdenum atoms and their specific interaction with the framework aluminum atoms, so we can, based on the image, we can determine, we can locate the aluminum atoms in the framework, in the framework. Well, MOVs are much more sensitive than zeolites. Well, the good news is that recently we found IDPC stem can also be used for MOVs. So here are two typical examples, one uh, image for UIO66 and the other for MU101. And uh, the uh, image resolution is 1.5 astrom and 2.0 astrom uh, respectively. And uh, these resolutions are already uh, as good as the resolution we can obtain uh, by using the ultra low dose HRTM. Well, as mentioned before, the advantage of IDPC stem is that the image are directly interpretable without the need of, you know, for uh, image processing. Okay. We can acquire the image and the image is directly interpretable. And at the same time, as you can see, the image contrast is also very good. It's also very good, right? So I think uh, IDPC STEM has a great potential for more imaging. And I think this great potential should be further explored. Uh, here I put together some electron uh, microscopy images of MU101 acquired in different years. And this clearly illustrates that with the advancement of imaging technique, 
more and more structured details can be revealed, right? It was very difficult to identify the mesoporous cages at early years, but now it's quite easy to see even the metal clusters, very, very small metal clusters can be identified in the image. So with this, I would point out that atomic resolution imaging of morphs has evolved from impossible to nearly routine. And uh, this ability offers a lot of opportunities to you know, study more unknowns about morphs. Well, the last topic of my talk today is how to prepare TM specimen from morph crystals. As you know, uh, for TM imaging, the specimen needs to be very thin. The thinner, the better, right? So usually a uh, specimen thinner than 50 nanometer is required for high resolution imaging or for quantitative analysis in TM. Well, because morphs are conventionally considered unsuitable for TM characterization, so no attention has been paid uh, before uh, to, but now we have demonstrated uh, TM imaging of morphs is possible, is feasible. So now is the time to think about how to prepare the TM specimen from bulk morph crystals. So far, all the TM study on morphs are used nano-sized crystals for imaging without uh, sample preparation. But in, in, in practice, many morphs that we are interested in are in the form of bulk uh, crystals, not nano crystals. So how to study this bulk morph crystals by sample preparation. Now here, I just uh, make a long story short. We recently uh, found if we perform focus ion beam uh, at liquid nitrogen temperature, then we can use ion beam to cut a very thin slice from the morph crystals. So this is the workflow to show how the cryo FIB works. Okay, if you do FIB at room temperature, it will destroy the morph structure completely. But if you perform FIB at liquid nitrogen temperature, you can use iron beam to cut a slice and you can extract this slice from the crystal and then you can use high resolution ima imaging technique to observe the structure, okay? Here you see the resolution is very high. That means at liquid nitrogen temperature, the morph structure is stable even you use iron beam to prepare the specimen, okay? I think because time is limited and uh, yeah, I would like just quickly go through the results without uh, explaining the details. So from this image, this is a, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, this is a, a HKUSD crystals. The crystal, the original crystal size is about 20 micrometer. So it's not possible to, to directly observe using a TM. But with crowd FIB, we can prepare a good specimen and then we can use TM to observe the specimen, okay? And we see a lot of defects in this seemingly perfect crystal. So just want to hear, I just want to emphasize that such structure details, this structure features uh, in a large morph crystals cannot be discovered if we don't have a suitable specimen preparation and imaging technique. Okay, I think time is up. So let me uh, end my talk by acknowledging the following people. So Da Liang, Yi Han, uh, Ling Mei, Xinghua, Nini, and uh, without their great efforts and hard work, uh, we would not be uh, we would not have been post uh, be able to develop the imaging uh, methods. We we will not be able to see so many interesting uh, data. And I would also give my special thanks to Dr. Mingpan from the Gatan Company because uh, he assisted us to try our idea of using the new camera for morph imaging at the very early stage of this project. And I also thank many collaborators around the world for the opportunity to study their interesting materials and as well as for their uh, experimental and the theoretical support. And finally, thank you all for your attention.